and you have a flashlight in your hand. But other than that, it's the same. So this part of the prison was actually the site of a guard's suicide in uh, the early 20th century, the turn of the century. So 1901, 1902, there was this guy named Frank Rutledge. He was the leader of a three-man gang of bank robbers. Uh, they came up from uh, Chicago, and they started robbing banks in uh, Parkdale and Aurora and places like that until they're finally captured and they're put here in the dawn. Now, on the day of their trial, uh, all three guys were being escorted on a horse-drawn carriage uh, when, and this was just on Gerard Street, right? So when they got to Sumac, uh, one of their accomplices came up to the, the carriage and he threw in a package full of guns. Uh, the, the gang ripped open the package, you know, retrieved the guns, opened fire on the guards point blank, killing one of them. Uh, the guards returned fire, killing one of the gang members. The other two guys tried escaping, but they tried escaping on a streetcar. So they're caught in about five seconds and returned right back here to the dawn. And now, because, because they had killed the guard, they knew what their fate was going to be. They weren't just bank robbers anymore now, they were murderers. So they knew that they were going to be executed. So for whatever reason, the main guy, Frank Rutledge, he was very much, he was determined to sort of be the architect of his own destiny. He figured that if he was going to die, he was going to die by his own hand. So according to reports, one day, Rutledge was seen pacing around his tiny little cell like a caged animal. And then the next day, um, there used to be a spiral staircase, a wooden spiral staircase, that led all the way from the basement, uh, and it went up right over there, all the way to the third story balcony. And you can see where the gate is in front of that room there. That would have been the access point to the second story balcony. So Rutledge and a few other prisoners were being led up the staircase by guards when he broke free. But instead of trying to escape, because he would have had to have gone through the guards and then through the front door, so it would have been pretty much impossible. Instead of trying to escape, he actually bounded up three steps at a time all the way to the top story balcony, and he put his feet on that bottom railing right there, and splayed his arms open, and then with his back facing us, sort of leaned backwards, and then, you know, leaned backwards just enough for gravity to take hold of him, and he took a swan dive backwards, and according to my exact mathematical calculations, he landed right where you're standing with a splat and um, slid his head open. And the funny thing is, a lot of people you know, might suggest that he would have been better served if he just waited to be hanged. Because by choosing to kill himself, he ended up staying alive for about three excruciating hours in that room up there. So that was the infirmary. That's where we used to treat sick and mental patients. So he ended up staying alive for three excruciating, excruciating hours in that room with the contents of his head literally leaking out of his skull. Okay? And actually, since I pointed out that room, that room was the site of a guard's murder about 40 years later. So in the 1940s, there was this inmate in here who faked a sore throat so that he could get up there because he knew that his buddy was waiting for him up there. The two of them had sort of collaborated on an escape plan. So once he got up there, he saw his friend playing cards with the guard. So he walked up to the card table and grabbed it and sort of flipped it over and threw it at the guard. Now at first, the guard just dismissed this as horseplay until the sore throat guy, he picked up a metal pipe and smashed the guard underneath his uh, chin, breaking his windpipe so that he couldn't scream for help. And then the two guys, they rounded up all the mental patients that were, you know, floating around the infirmary, made them go back to their cells, and then they took turns beating the guard until he was within an inch of his life. And once the guard was suitably dispatched, you know, literally bleeding to death on the ground, uh, he was beaten so badly that he couldn't even crawl towards the emergency panic button. And once this, was, once this occurred, they tried escaping, so they tied together some bed sheets, and you know, they tried going through the window, but the bed sheets broke. Uh, the first guy, the sore throat guy, on his way down, the bed sheets broke about 20 feet above the ground. So he didn't just fall 20 feet, though. He fell on some metal guard railings, like this, so he busted up both of his arms really badly. Somehow, he still managed to escape, um, but the police found him about 22 hours later, underneath the Dundas Street Bridge with a fully loaded revolver that was completely useless to him because, you know, his hands were so mangled that he couldn't even pull the trigger. Okay? So we haven't even started the store in the place that I said we should start, but we've already heard about a suicide, a murder, and escape attempt.